Hello students, today we'll be doing the current affairs for uh, the 4th of uh, March. Now, the first and most important topic uh, is again the death penalty, which is a controversial uh, topic uh, because a lot of countries have uh, banned death penalty, especially in Europe. Most of the countries have banned death penalty. Uh, even in America, it's banned. However, India has not banned the death penalty, though there are global calls for uh, removing of the same. Then PM Janoshadi Yojana. Uh, we shall discuss this particular scheme. And then use of vacuum bomb. bomb. What is this vacuum bomb and how does it work? Uh, IAEA, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency. And then uh, the other news uh, that has been there in the news for the last uh, one year is the AP government and its uh, three capital policy. India's first dugong reserve, this is important from prelims perspective. And the International Court of Justice, which is important from both uh, prelims and mains perspective. So the most important topics again would be this one. And this one and this one. Now, the first topic, which is death penalty. Why should we abolish the death penalty? Okay, these are some of the points which says that it is necessary to abolish death penalty which means that one no state should have the power to take a person's life and it once it is done it is done there is you can't go back and then restore a person's life what if there are uh, later it is proved that he was not guilty of the crime however the other uh, uh, reasons for having death penalty is that it serves as a deterrent for committing that particular crime if it is of a very uh, grievous nature and there is a need to remove people who are doing such crimes uh, so it serves as a deterrent and also maintaining a secure system of prisons is very difficult you can't have a lifelong imprisonment so to avoid all that expense it uh, you have a death penalty also a lot of citizens support this death penalty okay now what is the reason for death penalty being in the news more than four decades after the last verdict on death sentence, a bench of the Supreme Court has made psychological evaluation of the prisoner mandatory. Before hanging, it is necessary for psychological evaluation of the prisoner. The Supreme Court has also sought a report on the inmate's conduct at the time of examining, whether only hanging remains the fitting punishment or if the person's conduct can allow him for a simpler punishment for other punishment apart from hanging now earlier what has been supreme court stand when it comes to death sentence the supreme court in the bachchan singh versus the state of punjab had established the rarest of rare doctrines what does rarest of rare means only in the most grievous crimes in the rarest of rare cases Will death sentence be used? It cannot be used in a common manner. Only very few crimes will attract death punishment. While mandating a comparative analysis of aggrava aggravating and mitigating circumstances in connection to the accused. Okay. The judgment laid down that a court must scrutinize both the crime as well as the criminal and then decide whether death penalty is the only suitable punishment or if anything lower than that can be awarded. Emphasis is also to be laid on aggravating and mitigating factors which are dependent upon the circumstances of the case. A lot of these factors will decide if death penalty is the only way out. In the Machi Singh case versus the state of Punjab, the Supreme Court had elaborated on this doctrine of rarest of rare. What are these cases? What does rarest of the rare mean? And what are the guidelines which surround rarest of the rare? Okay. So, these uh, include uh, now the circumstances that lead to awarding of death sentence depend upon the manner in which the crime was committed, motive for committing the crime, severity of the crime and the victim of the crime. And the ones that mitigate or reduce the nature of the crime consisted of the possibility of reformation and rehabilitation of the accused, his mental health and its and his antecedents what is his behavior like and has he reformed after the prison sentence so 
while deciding uh, these rarest of rare cases okay there are two things which are taken into consideration what are the circumstances for punishing him with the death sentence what are the reasons for punishing him and what are the reasons which reduce the punishment what are the reasons for punishing and what are the reasons for reducing the punishment both are to be taken into consideration for the capital punishment and only in the rarest of rare cases will you hand over uh, will you hang the person now what has the court said now taking a cue from the bachchan singh verdict the supreme court in a series of death sentence cases has recently held that complete assistance to the court in such matters would necessitate the production of not just evidence in the case but also latest state of mental health of the prisoner why because the mitigating circumstances the ones that can reduce death penalty or the factors that have to be taken into consideration to reduce the death penalty will include uh, his ability for reformation for rehabilitation his mental health hence the mental health is important uh, to know before going ahead with the death sentence now uh, okay one more thing is that uh, currently there are uh, several countries which have banned uh, death penalty even in the us around 16 states have abolished death penalty though the other states have death penalty still usa 16 states have abolished death penalty while the other countries still have it okay uh, the other thing is that in india only the president can pardon death sentences okay the governor of states have other powers that is they can uh, they can reduce the severity of the punishment uh, they can provide respite however they cannot pardon pardoning and absolving a person of the crime cannot be done by governor okay okay moving on next uh, pradhan mantri bharatiya jan aushadi pariyojana okay uh, now the reason why it is there in the news is because recently on the second day of the jan aushadi divas celebrations the minister for chemicals and fertilizers flagged off the jan aushadi rath and jan aushadi mobile vans and jan aushadi e rickshaws from new delhi as a part of the week long celebrations now the jan aushadi rath will travel for 7 days covering 4 to 5 states and the vans and the e rickshaws will travel across delhi up to 7th of march in order to raise awareness at the grassroots level about the uh, pradhan mantri jan aushadi pariyojana and the generic medicines which are available for affordable prices uh no minister of chemicals and fertilizers is organizing the jan aushadi divas to create more awareness now this is the nodal ministry for pradhan mantri uh, bharatiya jan aushadi yojana nodal ministry please remember which is the nodal ministry and what is the implementing agency for schemes and what are the uh, prominent features of that particular scheme i have written over here uh, the pradhan mantri jan aushadi pariyojana has an objective of making generic medicines available at affordable prices to all why because what are generic medicines generic medicines are medicines which comprise of the same therapeutic benefits as any branded uh, medicine say for example there is uh, crocin now crocin is marketed by a branded pharma company however the chemicals that crocin comprises of they can be produced and sold by the government in the form of generic medicine and these generic medicines won't have any brand associated with them they'll be 
no brander branding and because of this uh, lack of branding they'll be available at a very cheap price however they have the same therapeutic benefits as that of a actual branded medicine they are not different from them it's just that they don't have any branding and thus publicity marketing cost will be reduced and uh, because of that they'll be at a cheaper price they'll be available and thus it can be used by poor people or it can be even used by rich people there's a need to make them more popular pradhan mantri bhartiya jan aushadhi pariyojana was launched by the department of pharmaceuticals under the ministry of chemicals and pharmaceutical fertilizers in 2008 but this scheme was forgotten and later it was revived in the year 2015 under the scheme dedicated outlets known as jan aushadhi kendras are open to provide generic medicines at affordable prices everyone can take uh, ownership of these jan aushadhi kendras you can also go register yourself as someone who can uh, take up this jan aushadhi kendras currently there are more than 6300 jan aushadhi kendras some of them are run by people common people like you and me now the pharmaceuticals and medical devices bureau of india is implementing the scheme uh please see if this is a society or not okay now what are the other features of the scheme now the other features are that it can create awareness about generic medicines through education and publicity so that quality is not synonymous only with high price we discussed what generic medicines are and quality can be even provided at a cheaper price okay uh it can it the yojana also aims to create demand for generic medicines by improving access to better healthcare through low treatment cost and easy availability wherever needed in therapeutic categories when you provide a uh, better healthcare options automatically the demand for medicines will increase or the demand for generic medicines will increase so this is one of the objectives of the scheme provide better healthcare so that the demand for generic medicines will increase now uh it is to be remembered again that uh these uh, drugs or these medicines generic medicines have the efficacy as much as a branded drug now okay there is also a jan aushadhi sugam mobile app in order to locate jan aushadhi sugam app which helps to locate the most nearby jan aushadhi kendra since there are more than 6300 of these kendras okay now more than no uh, more than about uh, uh, 32.5 lakh people are using uh, this particular app in order to avail services no during covid 19 time also jan aushadhi uh, kendra san jan aushadhi yojana was uh, extremely important for delivering generic medicines okay uh, moving on next topic is the cluster bombs and thermobaric weapons now what are thermobaric weapons and cluster bombs we will discuss that okay it's also available over here this infograph is very clear we will come back to this after uh, finishing of the topic as such now russia has resorted to the use of dangerous thermobaric weapons or vacuum bombs in ukraine now what are these vacuum bombs uh, apart from that it has also resorted to the use of cluster weaponry one is the thermobaric bombs and the other one is the cluster weaponry which has been banned by the convention on cluster munitions now what are thermobaric weapons like what we spoke of these are also known as vacuum bombs as they suck in the oxygen from surrounding areas to generate high voltage explosions the blast wave is of great intensity and duration than normal bombs and can vaporize humans humans won't even survive they are completely vaporized of it sucks in the oxygen and it creates a huge explosion while they cannot be used in taking down tanks and other such military vehicles they can dismantle civilian spaces like residential or commercial complexes okay those are thermobaric uh, bombs they generate a tremendous amount of heat in order to just vaporize people by sucking in oxygen 
oxygen is needed for combustion now what are cluster bombs cluster bombs are not, not they are not precision weapons they are non precision weapons they are just uh, used to create more uh, intensity of the blast they are not there to pinpoint really target anything and are designed to kill or injure human beings indiscriminately over a large area and to destroy vehicles and infrastructure such as railways etc they can be dropped from an aircraft or launched in a projectile that spins in flight scattering many bomblets uh we'll discuss it uh, through the picture later on many of these bomblets end up not exploding but continue to lie on the ground often partially or fully hidden posing a threat to civilian populations so even after the fighting is over what if civilians step on these uh disposed i mean the scattered weapons it can result in explosions for many years afterwards and it creates large scale destruction because it is not targeted uh to destroy only one place or one person it has a very wide range effect and that is the reason why that the convention uh on cluster munitions was enacted in order to prevent large scale destruction now you can see that it uh, carries this particular uh, launch vehicle it uh, carries a rack of around 24 thermobaric bombs it's usually many bombs which are stacked up one two so on 24 thermobaric uh thermobaric bombs and the launcher rack mounted on this battle tank okay now it is fired towards the enemy it scatters many bombs it scatters an explosive mist and then a secondary explosion then ignites the spreading cloud of oxygen and chemicals generating heat and blast waves that can penetrate buildings and shelters so over a huge area it explodes and it uh, you know scatters a mist initially so there's this huge mist which gets generated because of the first explosion and because of this entire mist which is spread over a large area the second explosion causes a even larger uh destruction okay uh this is just one thermobaric bomb which causes such a huge destruction imagine there are 24 thermobaric bombs which are there in everything now moving on it can cause a destruction even after long time after the war is over like what we spoke of now what is this convention on cluster munitions it's an international treaty that prohibits all use transfer production and stockpiling of cluster bombs Additionally the convention establishes uh, a framework to support victim assistance clearance of contaminated sites risk reduction and stockpile destruction all these are uh, done by the convention to help the victims and to clear out area which has been attacked by thermo thermobaric uh, missiles it was adopted in 2008 uh, both russia and ukraine are not members of this convention Russia is not Ukraine is not a member Now International Atomic Energy Agency Now Russia has informed the International Atomic Energy Agency that its military forces have taken control of the nuclear power plant <laughs> Zaporizhia Also there was a fire over here and uh, recently russian forces have put out the fire otherwise uh, there was a risk of explosion of the nuclear power plant the iaea continues to closely monitor developments in ukraine with a special focus on safety and security of the nuclear powered reactors okay now what is this iaea uh and what is this nuclear safeguards agreement uh please read the timeline of uh iaea in india now uh india has signed what is known as the 123 agreement the nuclear agreement for providing waiver with iaea waiver to use uh, to procure uranium despite not being a member of the npt treaty non proliferation treaty india is not a part of this treaty but still can access uranium because it has signed the 123 agreement with 
IAEA. This places Indian civilian nuclear facilities under IAEA safeguards. Okay. Now, moving. On. Please read about uh, where and all in India we have nuclear. Uh, uh, plants, uh, Kalpakam, Kudankulam, Ravadbata, Narora, uh, Kaiga, uh, Tarapur, and so on. Please uh, read all these uh, places where you have uh, nuclear uh, plants in India and what are the stages that they are in. Uh, okay. Next, okay. The International Atomic Energy Agency said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine marks the first time a military conflict has taken place amidst the facilities of a large and established nuclear power program. Okay, So it is a, a source of concern. What is the IAEA? IAEA was set up as Atoms for Peace Organization in 1957 within the United Nations family. It reports to both the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. Please remember this. And it has its headquarters as Vienna, Austria. So this is not a specialized agency of the United Nations. Yet it reports to the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. And it is just a part of the United Nations family. In 2005, it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their work. Now what are the functions of IAEA? It works with the member states to promote safe, secure and peaceful uses of nuclear technologies. It works for, you know, abolishing these uh, nuclear weapons and for promoting nuclear technology. Nuclear tech can be used for cleaning, for generating energy, for medicine, etc. etc. So, IAEA works on uh, a lot of those things. Now, what are the other programs of IAEA? Program of Action for Cancer Therapy, Human Health Program, Water Availability Enhancement Program, I-WAVE, International Project on Innovative Nuclear Reactors and Fuel Cycles, INPRO, then NUTEC Plastics, what is it? Nuclear Technology for Controlling Plastic Pollution, Okay. then Peaceful Uses Initiative, Race of Hope, Zoonotic Diseases, Integrated Action, Integrated Action, I'm sorry. Hence, if at all, there is a prelims question which says that all these programs are under which organization? You have to answer it by IAEA, which is headquartered at Vienna. Got the Nobel Prize. Please remember all these facts. Now, AP government can't change capital. The Andhra Pradesh High Court has recently given out a verdict saying that the state government has to construct and develop Amravati as the capital city of the state and the capital region within six months. The court directed government and the Capital Region Development Authority, CRDA, to discharge their duties as given under the APCRDA Act and land pooling rules. It directed the state to develop reconstitutional plots belonging to landowners and hand them over to landowners within three months. Development of the capital region within six months and reconstitutional plots within three months to the landowners. So these are the directions of the AP High Court. While it can be argued that the High Court has uh, uh, gone for activism, it has to be noted that this particular conflict regarding uh, division of the capital into three different entities has been a controversial one. There are a lot of uh, political pundits who have advised against uh, doing the same. To understand the background, AP High Court gave the final verdict after hearings in the case relating to writ petitions filed by landowners of Amravati. It is to be known that these landowners or farmers in Amravati had given their land under a land pooling scheme for the state government to develop their capital, to develop the capital of Andhra Pradesh, newly formed Andhra Pradesh. And these landowners would get a return on the land that they have given for capital development. That was the initial agreement. The previous agree previous government of Andhra Pradesh through land polling scheme had acquired 33,000 acres of agricultural land from 29 villages and promised to return developed plots in return 
apart from monetary compensation. However, the next government, which is the current government, dropped the project and decided to go ahead with the decentralization. So they enacted a decentralization act, Andhra Pradesh Decentralization and Inclusive Development of All Regions Act, which said that Amravati would be the legislative capital. Vishakhapatnam would be the executive capital and Karnool would be the judicial capital. These are regions which are in different parts of Andhra Pradesh. Amaravati, uh, which comprises of the region uh, between Vijayawada and Guntur. Then uh, Vishakhapatnam, Karnool. So in order to move away from this uh, scheme, this was envisioned under the Decentralization Act, AP, uh, Decentralization Act, uh, in order to, AP Decentralization Inclusive Development of All Regions Act, envisioned this, and now the High Court has uh, held that whatever agreement that the AP government had with the farmers, it cannot be revoked. It is an agreement that is done. And, uh, uh, yeah, the government has to go ahead with it. The High Court has given certain timelines of six months and uh, three months for certain functions to be performed. Okay, moving on. India's first Dugong Reserve. India's first Dugong Conservation Reserve will be built between Tamil Nadu's Park Bay and Sri Lanka. Park Bay is the region. What is a bay? A bay is a large body of water which is Surrounded by land on three regions. Now, Park Bay lies between India and Sri Lanka. So, India's first Dugong Conservation Reserve will be built in this particular region. It would be established in the Gulf of Mannar. A gulf is nothing but a large bay large a bay is uh, any region of water surrounded by land on three sides and it is small while a gulf is a large body of water it would be established okay it would be established in the gulf of mannar park bay between india and sri lanka for conservation of animals the reserve will spread over an area of 500 kilometers in the park bay on the southeastern coast of tamil nadu dugongs are on the verge of extinction as in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, their population was less than 100. Okay. Uh, however, under the IUCN uh, okay, list, it is in the vulnerable category, not in endangered category. Both in the Gulf of Mannar and the Gulf of Kutch, there are very few sporadic records. So please know that dugongs are available both in the Gulf of Kutch as well as Manar. Okay. Moving on. What are dugongs? Dugongs are known as sea cows. And it is the state animal of Andaman and Nicobar. Why are they known as sea cows? Because they are herbivorous. And they even look like a cow. They are huge uh, animals. This endangered marine species survive on seagrass and other aquatic vegetation found in the area. They are marine mammals. And hence, they have to surface every four minutes to breathe. They need constant supply of air, like whales. They are also mammals and hence, they also sur uh, surface. Even dolphins are mammals. Uh, whales. Now, it is the only herbivorous mammal that is strictly marine and is the only existing species in the family of Dugongidae. Only herbivorous mammal that is strictly marine, only exists in water. It is vulnerable under the IUCN red list, like what we spoke of. Now, other important topic, International Court of Justice. Ukraine has filed an application before the International Court of Justice, instituting proceedings against Russia regarding a dispute relating to the interpretation of the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the crime of genocide, genocide convention. Now, why has uh, Ukraine filed a case before the ICJ regarding violation of this convention? Now, Ukraine has said that Russia has claimed that acts of genocide have been 
taken up in Luhansk and Donetsk in Ukraine. Where are these regions? If Ukraine is over here, the eastern part has Luhansk and Donetsk. Both of these are known as Donbas region. Over here, Russia has held that there is a genocide com com committed against Russian-speaking citizens by Ukrainians. And hence, it is attacking or intervening in Ukraine to protect its own citizens. That is the justification that has been given by Russia. However, Ukraine says that Russia has violated this convention by going against the definition as given for genocide in this convention and used that as a pretext to recognize the independence of these regions and going for war against Ukraine. Okay. Now, what is the ICJ? ICJ is one of the six principal organs of the United Nations. The other principal organs being Security Council, Trusteeship Council, uh, ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council, General Assembly, Secretariat. Okay, these are the other five. And all these are in New York, while ICJ is in Hague. ICJ is based out of the Peace Palace in Hague. It is a continuation of what we had under the League of Nations at the Peace Palace itself. League of Nations was the entity that was there before the United Nations and it was formed after World War I. The official language of ICJ are only two, English and French, unlike what is there for UN. We have around five or six languages for the UN. ICJ has 15 judges. Currently, Indian uh, there is also an Indian judge known as Mr. Dalvir Bandari, if I am not wrong. He is there in his second term. So, having more than one term is not prohibited. ICJ has 15 judges who are elected to 9-year terms by the General Assembly and the Security Council, which vote simultaneously. But they vote separately. They don't vote together. The judges are also distributed as per regions. Three judges have to be from Africa, two from Latin America and Caribbean, three from Asia, five from Western Europe, two from Eastern Europe. So many judges from Europe. Which shows the uh, bias within the United Nations. The court's role is to settle uh, disputes in accordance with international law, legal disputes submitted to it by the states and to give advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by the United Nations organs and specialized agencies. Thus, first thing is it solves disputes in accordance with international law. League, okay. Now, second thing is it's... A, solves legal disputes submitted to it by the states. Third one is it gives advisory opinions submitted to it by United Nations organs or specialized agencies. Okay. It has no jurisdictions. It has no jurisdiction to try individuals accused of war crimes or crimes against humanity. This is there with the International Criminal Court which was formed under the Rome Convention. Okay. As it's not a criminal court, unlike the International Criminal Court, it does not have a prosecutor who will initiate proceedings. ICJ is not an apex court to which national courts can turn to. So, Supreme, there won't be cases that will be referred to from the Supreme Court to the ICJ. It does not take up ICJ does not replace the national courts. Okay. You can't have a case going from the national courts to there. It does not also act like an appeal court for international tribunals. However, it can make a ruling on the validity of these arbitration awards. You can't have international tribunals also appealing to international, uh, into the ICJ. But it can make a ruling regarding the validity of this arbitration proceeding itself. No appeal, but if this arbitration is valid itself. Okay. ICJ cannot take up SOMO2 cases. It can only hear cases or disputes when requested to do so by those independent states. It cannot take it up by itself or by the United Nations Security Council. Even the UNSC can refer cases. Uh, 